Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 2 this morning. Mark chapter 2. It's a blessing being back at the Faith Baptist Tabernacle. I enjoy being here. And I told the folks last night, your pastor was probably my first friend in California as far as pastoral friend. And uh, when I first got here and uh, Bible Fellowship Baptist Church, the, um, felt kind of alone there for a little while, and uh, but I found a good friend in your pastor, and I appreciate him so much. Appreciate the chair. I'm I'm in the midst of uh, waiting for a back surgery, so I've got five herniated discs. So uh, if I can set half the time, I'm fine. If I don't, I'll I'll, I'll give my wife a hard time tonight, probably, but. She, she's okay. I mean, she just, she says, even this morning, she says, you're stiff this morning, aren't you? And I, just by the way I'm walking, she's, I said, well, I'm stiff every morning, but um, I'm in the VA system, so we're waiting for that. But uh, pray for me on that, because I'm, I'm, I get, I've heard people tell me that have had back surgery that when you, you're ready, you'll know you're ready for it, and I'm ready for it. I'm just tired of pain. I've tried everything else, and nothing has worked. So anyway, um, appreciate the chair. Mark chapter number two, we're going to talk about how to bring people to Jesus this morning. And that's kind of the theme of the missions conference is the thing of of missions is is ultimately bringing people to the Lord Jesus for his honor and glory. But in Mark chapter two, we have an account about bringing people to Jesus. Literally, these guys brought their friend to the Lord Jesus. Let's read it in Mark two, verse one. And again, he, he, Jesus, entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. You know, it's always good news when Jesus is in the house, right? We're thankful that he's in the house today. He promised to be with us. Straightway, there were many gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Oh, who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up thy bed, his, uh, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. This is quite a story. I, I, I just, there's so much here. I love when, you know, they said in their hearts, Who is this that can say he can forgive sins? And Jesus said, he, he's just showing him again that he is God. He said, why are you reasoning that in your heart? You know, <laughs> the old, end result was they, they were all amazed and glorified God and said, we've never seen anything like this before. But anyway, this passage is all about reaching uh, people for Jesus and these guys bringing their friend to Jesus. You know, the Bible says, go into all the world. And Mark here, at the end of Mark and Mark 16, he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So that's the Great Commission, or one time it's given. The method varies. The message is always the same. The mandate is always the same. We're to go into all the world with the gospel. But how we do it varies. And um, from person to person, from from, uh, city to city, country to country. But the mandate is the same. And and we, we must do the Lord's command. However we do it, we it's it's a mandate. Someone said that missions is not the ministry of a few choice hyperactive Christians in the church. 
Missions is the purpose of the church. So God wants all of us to be involved in this matter of missions. And if we're going to stay committed to this matter, this is why we do missions conferences. This is why we have a missions emphasis week or day or whatever. It's a it's to recharge us in this matter because we get lax. And I know even as a pastor, you say, oh, the pastor's always fired up. Well, maybe yours is, but here's one that really is being honest, you know. We get lax in the matter of, uh, we do it, but sometimes we just kind of lose the, the edge, so to speak. And we need to be fired up on this matter and stay, stay uh, consistent in this. And these guys, I, I want to show you four things about these guys that they did. And I'm going to use the letter C for the, I don't always alliterate, but I am going to use letter C. First of all, conviction. What is a conviction? A conviction is a firmly held belief or opinion. A conviction is something you believe and stand for without a shadow of a doubt. These guys had a conviction. They believed with all their heart that if they got their friend to Jesus, he could help them. He could help them. And so they went about doing it. And we, as we go into the world, all the world, we have to have some convictions about us. One, we need to have the conviction that all men are sinners. All men need the Lord. And uh, I get frustrated, as you do. You watch the news. You watch what's going on in this world. Let me remind you that people are acting that way because they're sinners. Sinners act like sinners. You know, we, we get upset. And we say, oh, I can't believe that they're doing that. And, and really, uh, I think a lot of people, and especially in our leadership, have been given over to a reprobate mind and things like that. We're seeing things that are just totally unbelievable today. But they're really, they're, they're sinners that need Jesus. We have to have that conviction in our heart. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because all men are sinners, all men that die in their sin go to hell. Those are convictions that we need, and we have to remember that when we do this business of winning souls and doing missions. And because they're all sinners, they all need salvation. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord wants all to be saved. He desires, 1 Timothy 4, 2 4, he, who will have all men to be saved, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's not God's will that any should perish. And you know, there's a there's a movement that is it's not new. The, the reformed Calvinistic type preaching, but it's it's invaded our churches, our independent Baptist churches, and it's not it's not a good thing because what it does it kills soul winning, it'll kill the missions program. It's like it it says, well, God has a certain number of people that are saved and are going to be saved, and a certain number of people that are destined to be lost and die and go to hell, and so therefore, why should I go out and do this when God's already determined that? That if, if that's the mindset, then you'll get a you'll get a a fatalist mindset, and it'll kill the evangelism program of the church, and that's what's happened. But I always say to those guys, I'll say, okay, well, I'm just going to give you a pen knife because I always carry one. I'm going to say, I'm just going to give you this, and you go ahead and cut those verses out of the Bible that read that I just read, because the Bible is very clear that God wants all men to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. Now, are all men going to be saved? No, we know that. Uh, we know that. You and I have, have, have buried friends and family that weren't saved. We know that. that but it was, was it God's will for them to be saved? Absolutely. So you'll never take the gospel to the wrong address. If you learn those things like the Calvinistic teaching, I always say you didn't learn that from the Bible. Who have you been reading? What have you even been reading? What, what kind of material? Because you don't learn that from the Bible. The Bible, and it's God's will because all men are sinners, all men need salvation, and Jesus' blood is sufficient for all men. But it's our job to get the message to those who don't know. There's people in this city that don't know. We had a lady come, or some children come to our King's Kids ministry on Wednesday night about two months ago in March, and uh, the kids in our church were asking their, their other kids if they could go to church. And, and the kids said, we don't know what that is. And uh, these kids were, you know, like 10 years old on down. And so the, the mother went to their mother's house. And this is an American. 
There's people that grew up here in Sacramento. And she said, what is a church? What is that? I don't even know what that is. So she had to explain it to her. Well, it's a place where we learn about God. And, and, and Drew was here that month. And Drew took that little 10-year-old girl from what is God to receiving Jesus in three weeks. He worked with her for three weeks, and, and the oldest girl got saved. But what am I saying? I'm saying that we're in America, here we are in our mission field. America has become a mission field where people, they've, they've grown up not even knowing about a church, not even knowing. Now, we are in church. Most of you are not like that. But I, I, I was in church before I was born, right? I mean, I, before what I mean is in my mother's womb. I was, I was there. I don't know anything but church, but we're living in, in, a, in a land now that's not like that. So all men are sinners. All men need salvation. And sometimes we see the pictures that the missionary shows us of pictures of people maybe in Canada or in Australia or in, in Africa or somewhere like that, and we think, oh, those people really need the Lord. Well, what about your neighbors? What about those that we work with? They need the Lord. All men are sinners. All men need salvation. And we also need that conviction that all men who are saved should be seeking the lost. Every one of us should be seeking the lost. These guys in Mark chapter number 2, verse 3, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. These guys, these four guys got a burden for their friend. And they felt like, hey, if we can get this guy to Jesus, he can do something for him. They had heard that he could heal, and they wanted to bring him there. So they knew that they couldn't do it himself. They couldn't heal him. But they knew that Jesus could, and they got a burden for them. And they, they, they could have gone on their own business. They could have heard the word that the healer was in town. And, um, you know, oh Joe's over there laid up. You know, he's, he, he can't walk. But, you know, Joe's always going to be like that. He's just, he's always going to be like that. No, they got a burden and they went to him. And we've got to go to the people, right? We've got to go. Nowhere in the Bible is the lost commanded to come to church. But plenty of times in the Bible, we're commanded to go into the world. Go into the world, the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in. I think of the Samaritan in Luke chapter number 10. You know the story of the good Samaritan there. The religious guys, they pass by. But that Samaritan, the Bible says he went where he was. And we've got to go where the sinners are. We've got to go where they're at and compel them to come in. So there's that conviction uh, that has to be there if we're going to reach people with the gospel. And I, now, how do we go? Well, we go with the gospel with our lives. We go with our funds. We go with, with our prayers. But it costs to get the gospel to the world so that the gospel is free to people, but it costs to get it there. Every one of these flags represent families that, that are on the field because you help them get there through your funds. And it does cost to get there. And the cost of living is not going down anywhere. It's going up everywhere. And I, I stay in touch with our missionaries, and, and they... They, I know they don't like whining in their prayer letters, but you know if you just get down to the nitty-gritty with them, hey, how's it going? What's the dollar doing right now? Unfortunately, for foreign countries, the dollar's strong, which is unfortunate for them. It's fortunate for people like us spending dollars over there. But it, it still costs a lot to live. And we want to be able to support these people in these mission fields because they can't work a job like a pastor here can. You know, praise God, your pastor is supported by your church. I'm supported by our church. But we could, if we needed to, go out and get a job. You go to a country like we served in southern Sudan, I couldn't go get a job. They would not grant me a worker's visa to get a job uh, in that country because I'm taking a job away from an African that could be working there. So we support missionaries so that they can work in, and offer the gospel freely to the people. So it costs. And uh, that's why we... We go into all the world. That's why we have a local outreach here in our church is because of that conviction that all men are lost and all men need to be involved bringing people to Jesus Christ. That's conviction. That's the first C. The second C is compassion. We see this with these guys. Someone said 
Compassion is your hurt in my heart. I like that. Jude, verse 22 says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. That is, when you have compassion for someone, you'll make a difference in their lives. Aren't you glad someone had compassion for you? Man, I am me. Whew. Wow. I was lost. I was serving in the military. I was in England, the country of England. I was uh, newly married. And... Uh, my boss was a member of an independent Baptist church that was started by a missionary there in that country. And my wife's boss was married to my boss. And so it was two on two. And then it was, then when my wife got saved, it was three on one. And I said, oh, I'm saved. She said, no, you don't got what I got. <laughs> she knew me, right? But I'm glad they had compassion on my soul. They, I mean, listen. I tell the church this, and, and they don't believe this, and you may not, but it's the truth. I mean, once we, we started going to that church, and I remember that the preacher got up and he talked for like 15 minutes. And then he said, now let's pray. And I'm like, well, that wasn't too bad. That was just the introduction. He preached for an hour after that, and I, and I, was, I was sick of it. He says on the way out the door, he said, hey, Dennis, we'd like to have you for lunch. And I said, no, just like that. We got in the car, my wife said, what's wrong with you? I said, I never want to see that guy again. That guy became my pastor. <laughs> that guy, I love that guy. But listen, they'd come out on Tuesday night visitation. Well, the first night, I didn't know what Tuesday night visitation was. I let them in. And they, <laughs> they said the same thing sitting on my couch that they had told me from that pulpit, you know, that I was lost and all that. Well, I went back the second time. I was miserable when I left then too. Next Tuesday night, you know what I did? I saw him pull up in the driveway, and I had the curtain shut. And I told my wife, you turn off the television and be quiet. You said, how wicked is that? That's me. And they were knocking on that door. I said, we're not home. I'm just, no. And I did that week after week because I was, but they kept coming, and they kept having compassion for my soul. Praise God. I mean, I was a tough nut to crack. But, hey, there's people out there that, you know what that makes me do? When I go door knocking and I know they're home, I keep knocking. I may go around the back door, you know. I tell my wife or somebody, you stay here. I'm going to go around the back just in case they're running out the back. Because, because I know how I was. Well, we've got to have compassion for people. That will make a difference in people's lives. Compassion comes from a heart filled with the love of Jesus. Missionary Henry Martin said the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we become. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ constraineth on us, constraineth us. Jesus had a heart of compassion on us in our lost condition. And because of that, we need to have a heart of compassion for lost people. We need to have a heart of compassion. Remember where God brought you from and remember what you were before somebody reached you. Even if you're a church-going lost church member, somebody had compassion on your soul. And we need to have that heart. It comes from a heart filled with the heart of Jesus. Jesus' heart in us is a compassionate heart. I, years ago, when I, I, I pastored in Louisiana for a number of years, and uh, I saw a front page of a Houston newspaper one time, and it had a mother, an older woman, with her head down on the chest of a young man. And, and the caption was, she was listening. Her son had died, and this man had gotten her son's heart. And it said she was listening to her son's heart beat in that man's chest. And I thought, wow. You know, if we put our ear up to Jesus' heart, we'll hear his heart beat for this world. God still loves this world. As wicked and evil as this world is, and as bent as this world is on on going against God, God still loves this world. And he wants us to still love this world. That comes from compassion. We need to have compassion on this world. And these guys, they had compassion. And they brought their friend to Jesus Christ. We, we can't be effective in bringing people to Jesus without compassion. You know, I, I kind of like numbers, but I, I, I every now and then look at the, the, the world meter. It's called a world meter or something like that. And it gives you the number of people on the clock that are dying like that and, and that are 
that are being born. And you know that 158,000 people die every day. Over 100, almost 159,000 people die. That's 125 people a minute. In this world, will die a minute. Okay, in an hour, 7,500 people will die in this hour of Sunday school. In this world. Well, twice as many of those are being born. You look at that world meter, and it's just about almost exactly double of the people being born. So if 158, almost 159,000 die every day, let's see, 353,000 are born every day. And they need somebody that'll care for them and go to them with the good news. That's compassion. If we just get wrapped up in doing our own thing, and I want to tell you, I said this last night at the at the missionary supper. I said, you know, COVID it it did a whammy on us as far as being locked in and not going out like we should. But I won't say that COVID's over because it's I don't know that it'll ever be over. But that did a whammy on us. And we, we've got to get back to where we're going out. We've got to get, and I'm talking to myself here, where, where we don't have to, you know, worry about, I mean, people may fear and all those kind of things. I'll jump through hoops if I can get in to see people, but we've got to, we've got to go and, and it takes compassion in our heart. The third thing, and it's really seen here is co- co- cooperation. It says he was born of four, or carried by four. These guys, cooperated to get their buddy to Jesus. They cooperated. And it takes cooperation to get the job done. It takes cooperation in every one of us in this church to be involved in the missions program of this church or the local outreach of this church. The uh, brother pastor, pastor said that you've, you, I know you, didn't you do the, the John and Romans putting together those before? Yeah, that's a neat project when you get involved because people get involved doing that. Well, that's, that, it takes it takes the, the, the seed line people from the gospel, the print, they, they bring them to churches because they need cooperation in getting, the, getting that done. And so it takes cooperation among the saints, first of all, among us. Listen to what God says in Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, that verse in our Bible has an exclamation mark. God gets excited when we are dwelling together in unity. And unity is something that we have to strive to continue to keep in the local church. And so it takes unity among the workers and or the saints, and then it takes work, unity among the, the workers. Uh, turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. Paul's writing, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, your God's husbandry, your God's building. Do you get that? That we're nothing. Paul says, I'm nothing. Apollos is nothing, but God's everything. And they, we get involved in this matter of cooperation with the saints and with, with the workers, and uh, we're nothing in and of ourselves, but God has chose to use us in cooperation to get the job done. And it might be passing out a track. You may plant a seed that, that takes root years later. I grew up in southern Missouri, and in my hometown, there was a Southern Baptist Preachers College. And I found this out years later from Southern Baptist Preachers that it was a good college. It was one of the, it was one of the strong ones in the convention. And uh, my dad used to hire those preacher boys to work for him. And, and uh, they, they were all the time witnesses and tried to give us tracts. And, you know, I would take a gospel track, and I knew I wasn't saved, but I knew there was something religious about this, and I didn't want to throw it away. And I'd stick it in this Bible that I had. You know, when I got saved, I pulled all those out, and I thought, you know, those guys are going to get some kind of reward. They sowed a seed that didn't take root till 20 years later, 6,000 miles away in a different country. God saved me, but the seeds were planted. And see, that's what happens. It takes cooperation. This guy, hey, if you've ever carried a, a litter, 
you know, like in the military, they call them litters. Well, they call them stretchers, I guess. But if you've ever done that, it takes everybody on each end of that stretcher doing the, uh, their work. You know, you get the guy on there, and, and this guy was sick of the palsy. He was a paralytic. He Dead weight, you know, he's on there, and that's better than them trying to help you, believe me. <laughs> I, I used to teach this in the military, but, you know, you put them on the litter, and then everybody's got to do their prop. If this guy here, he's carrying it, he said, hey, man, it's my girlfriend. I'm going over here. He drops it. You can't have that, you know. It takes cooperation, all four of them cooperating to bring their buddy to the Lord Jesus, cooperation among the workers. And um, we cooperate with these missionaries. You know, the Lord tells us in Acts chapter 1 that we're to be witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the world. Now, how can we be missionary? How can we be witnesses both places, here and there? The reason, the way we do it is through missions. We cooperate with these guys. We cooperate through our prayer. We cooperate through our funds that we give and the offering and, and the missionary and the church here supports those missionaries. We cooperate. Maybe we'll give up a week or two and, and maybe spend time with them and go over and visit them. And like your pastor has done, I've done, visit our missionaries, try to help them uh, do whatever they can. Just giving yourself to God. We're cooperating together to get the gospel to this world. And it takes cooperation. It really does. Somebody called these guys Brother Love, Brother Faith, Brother Unity, and Brother Faithful. <laughs> they all had their part, and they all did their part to get this man to Jesus. And the last thing is consistency. I love this because back in Mark chapter 4, or Mark chapter 2, verse 4, it says, When they could not come nigh him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay. Where in the sick of the palsy lay? They stayed consistent. They didn't get there with the guy and say, wow, we can't even get close to Jesus. Sorry, buddy, we're going back home. They didn't do that. They said, listen, we can get, to, we can get him in there. I, kind of, I read my Bible with kind of a sanctified imagination, you know. And I think maybe one of them might have said something like, hey, you know what, last week, last, last summer, I was having a hard time getting a job, and I, I got hired on to the Capernaum Roof Company, and I helped put that roof on. I think I can get it off. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But anyway, whatever, they, they were able to go up. Now, most of those houses in that day had a staircase going up to the top of the house because a lot of times they would spend time, you know, in the evening hours when it got cooler up on top of the roof. That was common. But all I'm saying is now they're going from carrying their buddy to the house now to taking him up on top of the roof, taking the roof off, and letting him down. That took some consistency. And I think, you know, in this matter of getting the gospel to people, we've got to be consistent. And... Um, Pastor and I both, you know, from time to time we uh, we talk, and and unfortunately, what comes up sometimes is so and so has quit. You know, so and so that used to be in the ministry, he's not doing it anymore. You know, I want to finish strong. I'm getting to the I'm getting older. You know, not as old as your pastor, but I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> but hey. I want to finish strong. I'm getting to the age where I think I'm on the downhill. Maybe I don't know how many years preaching I got left. What I, I'm not even, I don't have anything in mind. But I'm just getting to, I, I want to finish strong. And it's going to take consistency. This consistency in our going, first of all. You know, the going, God's calling men and women to go, and he's still calling men and women to go. And if God calls you to go, faithful is he who calleth you, who also will do it, First Thessalonians 5.24 says. So I know that these missionaries we support, they depend on churches like ours being faithful to support them, but we depend on them being faithful too. We depend on that. And so faithful consists in our going and our praying. Paul said this in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Our prayers are the missionaries' ammo that loads their weapons. You know, we wouldn't think about it in the United States, sending our soldiers and, 
and sailors, a marine, and airmen to the field without bullets in their guns or, or bombs or, you know, the right thing. We would not think about doing that. But when we send our missionaries to the field without praying for them, that's what we're doing. We're not supplying the ammo they need. You know, missionaries give you prayer cards. And, and as a missionary for uh, when we were there, you know, we had a lot more people that prayed for us than supported us. And we needed the prayer support. There were times when Karen and I were out in the bush and we got lost a few times. We had a satellite phone. We carried a satellite phone with us because there was many places where we had no type of reception with our phones. We carried a sat phone just in case we needed it. Praise God we never needed it. But I, I would say to Karen, there was times I'd say, I'd say, we need to pray right now that somebody would wake up in the middle of the night and pray for us. And we'd do that because we needed, we depended upon people's prayers. We were in an area one time and it was a thick demonic area. It was an area of northern Uganda where there'd been a lot of mass killings and, and uh, things had gone on in that area. And we were traveling up to Sudan and uh, it was just thick. You could feel the evil. And I says to my wife, I said, Karen, sing, sing, because I could just feel it. And my wife is a singer. If you know my wife, she's a very happy Christian. She is a joy to be around. And she says, I can't. She says, I, it can't come out. I'm like, we're in trouble now. <laughs> I mean, we're in real trouble. But I said, dear God, please wake somebody up and put them on our hearts to pray for. And, and you know, God delivered somehow. And maybe one day in heaven, we'll meet somebody that woke up. Hey, brother, I woke up in the middle of the night and I prayed for you. Well, I know you did because I asked God to wake you up, you know. But they depend on our prayers. And, and they're in areas. These, I'm going to tell you, these missionaries are in areas that are hostile to the government. Hostile to the gospel, excuse me. Think we got missionaries in China, as you do. China is clamping down. I mean, on, seriously, India, they're re- seriously clamping down on the gospel. And are these missionaries wanting to quit? No. They're wanting to stay there. They're trying to, but they're having to be creative to be able to stay there. And oftentimes it's our prayers that keep them there. So be faithful in our prayer, consistent in our going, our praying, and our giving. Paul told the church at Philippi, in Philippians 4.15, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. They had been faithful in their missionary support of Paul, and Paul now writes back and says, Thank you for doing that. Thank you for being faithful in your giving. And we need to be faithful. When we commit to give, Monthly, weekly, whatever, you, however you commit to give personally to the missions program of this church, you need to be faithful in doing it. If you give carelessly or sporadically or impulsively, God can't bless that. Let me get us. I, I give you a suggestion. How about you say, "Well, I, I sure do love my car. I think I'll make a payment this month." Just try that, huh? You feel good, oh, man? I just love my man. This house, this house is breaking down. It's leaking here. We got needing to be painted over here. I'm just not going to make a payment this month. No, that wouldn't work, would it? See, if you give impulsively, that's how you'll give to missions. But that's not how God wants us to give. God wants us to give faithfully. And, you know, when you get the cards and things, I like those because it's a reminder. It's a reminder. I keep mine right where I write first check to the tithe and missions. I keep it where I, where I pay, pay the bills right there so I'll be reminded. You say, well, you ought to not forget about that. I know I ought not forget about it, but you might, you know. But I don't want to forget. I want to be faithful to give because of the missionaries on this field, on the field supported by this church, depend on our faithful giving. And, you know, the churches will write back and they'll say, hey, thank you for being faithful. And I know that because as a missionary, we would get a report every month of the churches that were, and, and our churches were faithful to support. You know, when you see a church drop off for a couple of months, you start wondering. What's going on with that church? What's happening? Maybe the, maybe there's a problem with the pastor. Maybe there's a problem in the church. You know, and it's, and, and I'm going to tell you something. The missionaries suffer when there's problems in the church. Missionaries suffer. And so we need to be faithful in our giving, faithful in our, in our going, faithful in our praying. And then the last C, I said four, but I meant five. I was public school graduate, right? In Missouri. I said, we got four wonderful things and I've got five. The last one is confidence, and that's a quickie, but confidence. Confidence that the gospel 
is the answer. Salvation. There's only one way of salvation. That's Jesus. Why do we send the gospel to predominantly Catholic countries? Why do we send missionaries? Because Jesus is the only way. Some of you were saved out of Catholicism or other religions. and You know that that's not, that's not the true gospel. Why do we send missionaries to Muslim countries or to Indian Hindu countries? Why? It's because the gospel is the answer. And we're, we're called narrow-minded when, you, when we believe that Jesus is the only way. But we need to be narrow-minded on that. Listen, I, I want my doctor to be narrow-minded, don't you? I want my pilot to be narrow-minded. When I get on a plane, I want him to be narrow-minded. If I want to go to Memphis, I don't want him to be taking me to Houston. You know, or just get up there and say, well, f- folks, whoop. He'd say, well, folks, this morning, uh, I'm glad you're with us. I really don't know where we're going, but we're going to have fun. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, no. Hey, when I take, when I get a prescription that I can't read, <laughs> take it to a doctor that I can't pronounce his name, the pharmacist, I want him to be narrow. I want him to give me the medicine that the doctor has prescribed, right? But yet when, when we're narrow-minded on the gospel, people say, well, you can't be narrow on that. You know, whatever works for you. No, we've got to be narrow-minded on the gospel. And that's why we have the confidence. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was confident that the gospel, if it gets to somebody, will do a work. And so there's a challenge to us from these men that got their friend to Jesus. And the, and the ultimate result, I didn't even get to this part, but it's neat that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, thy sins be forgiven thee. You know, Jesus honors faith. And when he sees our faith involved in this matter of missions, he, I think he's still honored by that. I know he is. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the privilege to open your word once again. Seal these things in our hearts. Lord, I need this. I need to be consistent. I need to be more compassionate toward lost people. Lord, I pray that you challenge this church and our pastor here and all of us, Lord, to do more for you in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen.